engage in what I, I'm certain is going to be a rich and stimulating discussion. Um, in order, uh, let's go in alphabetical order of, uh, of last name. Um, first is uh, Jane McAlevey. Jane is a longtime union organizer, negotiator, author, and scholar of the labor movement, who also happens to be a fourth generation union member like President O'Brien. After having spent many years working on organizing campaigns, large and small, around the country, she went on to earn a PhD in sociology from our very own graduate center at the City University of New York, where she began working on her first of what have become multiple acclaimed books on union organizing and labor strategy. Her most recent book, co-authored with Abby Lawler, is Rules to Win By, Power and Participation in Union Negotiations, published this year by Oxford University Press. Jane is, a, is currently a senior policy fellow at the UC Berkeley Institute for Labor and Employment Relations and writes a regular column for The Nation magazine. Next, Chris Smolinski is a third generation Teamster who comes out of the union's trade show division. For many years, Chris has been a leader in Teamsters Local 25, where he was instrumental in building a futures committee dedicated to, organizing, to engaging with younger workers in the union's membership. And since 2015, he has served as a local's organizer, a role through which he has run successful campaigns to increase membership in one of the IBT's most militant locals. This record led President O'Brien, at the time serving as president of the New England Joint Council, to task Chris with leading a New England-wide organizing, England organizing department. And in this capacity, Chris has, and his team have scored dozens of victories and organized more than 2,000 new members since the pandemic, contributing to bringing that membership number up from 1.2 to 1.3 million. Chris currently serves as Eastern Regional Director uh, of, or Eastern Regional Coordinator of the IBT's organizing department and Deputy Director of the union's Amazon division. Finally, Steve Viselli is an economic sociologist who studies work, automation, and public policy. He's currently a faculty fellow at the Kleinman Center for Energy Policy and lecturer in the Department of Sociology at the University of Pennsylvania. Steve's first book, The Big Rig, Trucking and the Decline of the American Dream explains how deregulation of trucking and the rise of independent contracting turned trucking from one of the best blue collar jobs in the United States into one of the toughest. His current research, which is in the works for a subsequent book, looks at the impact of self-driving trucks on truckers and e-commerce on last mile delivery workers. So let's have a round of applause for our panelists just to start. And, w and we are incredibly privileged also to have President O'Brien join us. So we have four incredible panelists. I did the introduction of President O'Brien. We all know him well at this point. So I'm going to kick it off. I want to get us started maybe with just one kind of question to each of the panelists, and then we'll open it up and, and hopefully turn into kind of a wide-ranging discussion. But to just to kind of set the stage a little bit, I want to ask each of our panelists a question to get the ball rolling. So Steve, I want to start with you. Um, I think you know this panel is called Logistics Workers Rise. And so I think it would help if we could just start by taking a step back and defining what we mean by the logistics sector. Um, of course, the work of moving goods is as old as time immemorial. But the idea of logistics, logistics specifically as an economic sector, is relatively new. Um, and and uh, over the past several decades, the work done by people in these jobs has gotten a lot different. One could say worse. So could you get us started by explaining what we mean when we talk about logistics? And, and related to that, how have working conditions for those employed in this sector changed over the last few years or decades? Yeah, thanks. Uh, so you know, of course, Workers have been moving goods around the economy uh, for a long time. Logistics, really, I, I would pinpoint the start of it with trucking deregulation and the growth in global supply chains. And of course, logistics is you know moving stuff between you know fixed points of capital investment, whether it's extraction, production, right, into distribution. And so those have always been problematic for for employers. What happened with the logistics revolution, which started several decades ago, is that in an effort to run from labor and to create global supply chains, capital stretched things out further and further. Initially, that was an advantage um, for the early adopters, right? Uh, but it became a big cost center as well. And so essentially what, what the logistics revolution is, is an attempt to kind of squeeze those costs back out and maintain that competitive advantage from moving stuff faster um, and cheaper, right, to lean out inventories. 
um, and of course to, to maintain your mobility to uh, avoid labor, source uh, labor and resources cheaply abroad. A uh, big part of that, of course, has been deregulation, right? Uh, allowing uh, employers to use cheaper uh, systems, including independent contracting, which has been a big one, in particularly in long haul trucking, um, and, and technology. And so today what we're seeing is, is a, a, I would call sort of the second stage of, of that globalized supply chain revolution. We sort of stretched it out uh, with, with the big box supply system, sort of the, I think Walmart. Right, so bringing stuff thousands of miles uh, in relatively large quantities, few items, um, in re relatively few items, to places where you know, consumers go out to essentially a warehouse with a cash register and, and pick them up for themselves. Uh, and, and now we're entering the e-commerce right, and delivery uh, part of, of the logistics revolution. It, and that's a very different system, or very, very different part of the system, in which uh, corporations are aspiring to give access to millions of different goods almost instantaneously and perceptibly at no cost to those to those consumers right wherever they are as fast as possible and what that has meant is that we have uh, tremendous pressure on delivery workers to uh, make that work cheaper faster using technology outsourcing and the and the traditional methods that that corporations use to, to make uh, labor cheaper. And of course, it's gonna have impacts on the existing services. And uh, I'll just finish this by saying, you know, what we have had, I mean, a lot of times we have this comparison between, say, UPS and, and what Amazon's doing with DSPs. You know, think of it this way. Um, you know, 10 years ago, when you got a package from, from UPS or FedEx, it was a relatively high value good that you were gonna sign for, right? It, what Amazon is trying to do is move cheap stuff, right? And so they need to put that downward pressure on the delivery cost, right? Because they're trying to take that Walmart store, right, that big box supply chain, and turn it into a last mile delivery. And that's really a fundamentally different process. And so what workers are experiencing is this algorithmic management and the de-skilling of that delivery work, taking that if you will, from Braverman, if, uh, if everybody, if anybody's read that, right, the workman's brains out from underneath their cap. Um, so they're trying to take that, you know, knowledge, that experience, that career professional uh, UPS package car uh, driver uh, and turn it into an app on a phone, right, and so that they can de-skill it and use cheaper labor to, to do that. Great, thank you. Um, and we'll be following up on all of this, but again, just to kind of set the stage a little bit. Um, Jane, I want to move to you. Um, and I think it might be helpful if similarly we could start by taking a step back um, and reflecting upon where we are as a labor movement today um, and what you see as some of the key strategic questions we face. I mean, um, as President O'Brien spoke about, I mean, it's an exciting time, but it's also a challenging time. And when the excitement is real, but also shouldn't be overstated, we are still seeing union membership drop. It is as hard as ever to win a first contract. Um, so could you talk a little bit about how you make sense of this moment and, um, you know, where have where we been, where are we going? Yeah, my pleasure. Um, uh, and it's a pleasure to be on the panelists uh, uh, with these great folks. Steve and I had the pleasure of being locked in an elevator together, so we got a little <laughs> bit more time um, before arriving here. Um, but yeah, I, I, think, uh, I think we're in very interesting times. Um, uh, precipice of you know, authoritarian rule and some real disasters out there. And then incredible promise, mainly, because workers are fighting back in a really big way. Um, I think, you know, to the two unions that we are, one, addressing right here at the table, the Teamsters and the rebuild of the Teamsters under new leadership, um, and the UAW, uh, which is also a union under, frankly, brand new leadership, um, we are already seeing the impact of something that I have always thought a lot about as an organizer and negotiator, and now as an author, which is the role of leadership. It's pretty fundamental at the shop floor level as well as at the national level. So you can see the change in two union leadership teams in big private sector unions has already led to a dramatic change. I want to back that up for a minute by saying that for the 20, maybe 40 years, depending on the two unions, where they were not being led by uh, brilliant uh, leadership that was bold, rather in some cases corrupt, 
I sleep in the switch and just waiting to let things take whatever direction they took. Um, there was a lot of other really exciting work happening. And that was important, I think, to set the stage for what came today. So in 2012, a marker that I think really mattered was when the Chicago Teach, really 2010, the Chicago Teachers Union leadership had a radical change. And it led to, in 2012, a strike that changed the discussion in this country, in Chicago. Suddenly, you had 28,000 education workers off the job, which itself <laughs> was radical in the last 30 years in this country. Um, but not only were they 100% out, and every single right-wing institution continues in Chicago to prove, like, three of them crossed. You can't say 100% out. You know, three out of 28,000. <laughs> All right, round it down. Anyway, that strike was not brilliant just, just because it produced a 100% strike with just a year and a half of the leadership getting ready to do it from what was largely a dead union uh, for decades leading up to it. Their last strike had been 30-something years earlier. And the members were kind of put to sleep in the same way that they were in the auto workers and the same way they were for years in the Teamsters when the members are just ancillary um, to the process of the union itself. So Chicago kicks it off. They win an incredible strike. And part of why they won that incredible strike was because they did something ahead of time to outflank a very popular, or he was no longer, but a popular mayor when he first uh, came to town, which is Rahm Emanuel, right, who left the actual White House, who was the national congressional fundraiser for Democrats. I don't think that explains a lot, by the way. Um, and went back to become the mayor of Chicago and set his sole determination to destroy that strike. What he didn't know was that Karen Lewis, the genius president of the union, and her entire operation in the rank and file was way ahead of them in winning over community support and parent support. So when they took to the streets, and when at the time Mayor Rahm Emanuel stood up and said, you are hurting the parents and hurting the kids, uh, about 400,000 parents poured into the street in the marches behind the educators. That, to me, was game changer one. That sets the tone for the changes that come later. Because in my life experience, workers, workers are willing to stand up and risk and fight when they see other workers standing up, risking, fighting, and winning. Winning. I want to talk about winning. Workers don't stand up and take risk when they see defeat. They stand up and take risk when they see victory. So I think that's, frankly, the beginning of a huge rebuild. And just to go through another couple of game changers, you know, that leads to um, a huge strike in Los Angeles in 2019 at the United Teachers of Los Angeles. Again, massive, 100% out, shut the city down, um, and won on a broad array of social issues inside and outside the workplace. Historic contract inside, built community support behind them, engaged the broader community in actual contract surveys, regional meetings with parent leaders to make sure the parents were brought to the table, and won on a bunch of issues that are not what we call, they're not mandatory subjects of bargaining. Uh, labor law is so complicated. But there's mandatory subjects and there's uh, permissive subjects. And they went from mandatory on the power of that strike and forced permissive subjects like bargaining to keep the immigration customs enforcement police off of every single school in Los Angeles. That was an enormous victory that came from the parents' demands because the ICE officers would pull up outside of public schools, <clears throat> wait for the kid to come out, wait for the parent to show up and arrest the parent. Like that's what was going on in our public schools and being sanctioned. They eliminated that. And then I think the game changers become in my own union, I should say. I'm a member of the United Auto Workers. I had the pleasure of voting to make it direct election by the president. That was a first fun vote. And the second two fun votes, because there were two more, what did you get? Sean Fain as the leader of the union. By 2022, we have, you know, Sean O'Brien in leadership. Soon after that, we have um, uh, John Fain um, in leadership. Um, and even this year, we kick off 2023 with a massive strike uh, by educators, this time 60,000 strong. Uh, there's a unity between the, I'll say, harder to replace and easier to replace. I don't like the term more skilled and less skilled, frankly. I think all workers are skilled. Um, and in between that, we had the 2018, right up into the pandemic, we had the massive strikes, illegal, in red states, 
across the education sector. So there was a lot building, and there were a lot of workers being, maybe having their expectations re-raised, that if you fight in this country, you can win. And then we had the pandemic, and things got kind of closed down there for a couple of years. And now we're coming out of it, uh, and we're people are fighting like mad um, all around us. And people are winning. And the more we can win and show that fighting leads to winning, I think the more fighting there's going to be and the more winning that there's going to be. And the old notion of like social partnership, uh, the old one of banging on the table in the European context, social partnership, it's all over. It's all done. Capital is global. When I'm out working in Germany or someplace in Europe, um, all the same union busting tactics that I survived A-level boss fights in this country, coaching thousands and thousands of workers through and how to beat an A-level boss fight in this country, where they're terrorizing you, captive audience meetings, firing people. Um, when you can win those kind of campaigns, it positions you better, not just to go in and sweep up a good first contract in a hell of a lot less days than 400. Um, I like to keep them to about eight months uh, from election to victory. Um, by bringing in the whole community everywhere we go um, as our major source of power. So, you know, there's a, there's a long way to go, but the context that got us to this moment when logistics we know is central, by the way, logistics has been a central discussion my entire life in the labor movement. We just wasn't clear how we were going to get there given the existing leadership of the unions that could play a central role um, in it. So along the way, we looked for other strategic sectors. Education is one, those jobs are not going somewhere else may be privatized, but they're not leaving the United States. Another is healthcare. You know, a nurse is not gonna be giving a shot to somebody from China. They gotta do it actually in their arm up close. So there are other strategic sectors, and I think that they helped lay the framework. And my last comment on this is in every one of those unions, just like in the Teamsters and the UAW, bold action, a belief in the power of the rank and file, a belief in the intelligence of the rank and file, Every one of those unions had to go through a leadership change to do what they did, every single one that I just listed. So I think leadership matters because that's when we enable the rank and file to play the kind of role, honor the intelligence of the people who are the members of the union, um, and direct us, frankly, in the direction that we need to go when we're at the table negotiating. Thanks, Jane. Um, uh, Chris, I want to move to you, kind of building off what Jane said about leadership fighting, winning, um, and what Sean said a moment ago about the definition of insanity being doing the same thing again and again and expecting new results. Um, you are the one here with, along with President O'Brien, the most extensive experience organizing and representing workers in the logistics industry specifically, and you now serve as Deputy Director of the Amazon Division of the IBT. So I want to just kind of give you the floor to talk a little bit about what you see as the biggest opportunities and biggest challenges facing um, all of our collective efforts to take on this big company and this important industry generally. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, biggest opportunities and uh, the biggest hurdles. I mean, I, I think I'd like to start with the hurdles because I want to save the, save the hope for, for last. But, um, you know, I think the, the hurdles began a long time ago, right? When worker power was at its highest and we were taking ownership of the shop floor and walking off the job and demanding contracts, you know, out came Taft Hartley. Taft Hartley was designed to handcuff the labor unions, right, to keep us at bay. And what we're starting to see is a resurgence of shop, shop floor ownership. And that's one thing that we got away from. I, I believe it's because we were so strong at one point that we could just walk around, hand out cards. Everybody was connected to a labor union at some point, right? Everybody's mother, father, brother, cousin, somebody worked there, and the boss fights weren't what they are today, right? We had the power of the union and of the people. And that started to erode over time when we got into a representational mode. And I believe that, you know, it, it's our own faults. We started to talk about this grievance machine and representation and, oh, you have an issue, let me handle it. Right, you have an issue, let me handle it. And I'm starting to see it come back to, you have an issue, how can you resolve it? Let's get a game plan. You have to take ownership. Right, so I think that we got into this mindset of representation and forgot where the power of the union actually came from. And the power of the union comes from the shop floor. It comes from the workers, right? And we're starting to see that resurgence, especially here at the IVT under the leadership of O'Brien, recognizing the need to get involved on a shop floor level, to strategize with the workers, to push workers outside their comfort zone to take some ownership. 
Right? Everyone's starting to see that and, that, and that brings hope and light. And I think that's um, hugely important to what we're doing. And we're starting to see it all over the country. People are uprising. Young people are uprising. You know, I think for so long we were indoctrinated with get a job, go to work, keep your head down. The boss is the boss, right? People are just marching to work and taking whatever comes their way, and people are starting to get fed up. So now we need to harness that energy as a labor movement. We need to do the outreach, take the time to educate our new members, our young members, reach out to our communities, hold our electeds accountable if we're going to move forward with this labor movement and capture this energy we have now. I believe this energy that we have now is a snapshot in time, and it might not last forever. So we need to do what we need to do to capture that. And that's getting back to the grassroots of empowering workers. And that's kind of the strategy you heard President O'Brien talk about uh, the UPS and the strategy they took to not only get the leverage to, to get that historic contract, but to engage the members, right? Get them involved, find out, find out what they needed, what they wanted, have them participate in negotiations. And that's the strategies we're taking with everything, right? Specifically with Amazon. You can see Amazon uprising all over the, all over the country, right? And I don't believe there's a silver bullet for the Amazon, but I do believe that it has to be worker driven. And the workers have to be willing to take ownership, demand changes, and do whatever is necessary to make those changes. And in my eyes, that has to be walking off the job. They have to be willing to shut it down. I mean, I think we can learn from some of the past and some of these bigger campaigns that we've gone after and see that where we didn't have the capacity to shut it down, a lot of those campaigns were failures. And we're seeing it. Workers are taking action in the Amazon division all across the country. We see it in Pontiac, we see it in Palmdale, we've seen it in San Bernardino. I mean, I don't know if everyone's aware, but currently right now we have the first ESP, that's a delivery service provider, those that you see in the van, that were misclassified, out on strike. These workers organized, they negotiated, ratified an agreement. Amazon on June 24th, so we're no longer going to do business with you. You're a bad actor. And discontinued service. These workers didn't cower. They didn't go find other jobs. They took it to the street. And they've been on the streets ever since. And there's no end in sight, right, for these workers giving up. They've extended pickets throughout the country. They're bringing awareness to it. And they're taking on the fight. And this is just 84 people. Now, if we can work together and create partnership programs with our communities, our workers, you know, our, our members, workers in the logistics industry as a whole, and start getting people to support these workers, have these conversations about taking the shop floor power back, what it means to co collectively work together, educate them as to their rights, and provoke action. I believe we can take this on, and I believe we will win this. It may be a long fight, but I'm here for the duration, and I believe that we can take this company on. But we need everyone's help. Everyone's sitting in this room. We need to capture that energy. We already know that Amazon's growing at a substantial rate. And they have over a million workers in this country. You heard President O'Brien say it. We, we have 1.3 million members. We need everybody involved in this fight. We need every labor union. We need every community partner. We need every activist involved. Actually, here today, we have a, uh, a couple of uh, uh, organizers here today that after the, the, um, the event, they'll be outside with um, suppliers for anyone that's interested in getting involved uh, and supporting, you, there's a QR code where you can uh, scan it and, and take a look. Because there is a place for everybody in this movement. There's so much work to be done from community engagement to holding the electeds accountable to coalition work. There's just so many different pieces that there is a place for everybody. But in the end, I do believe we can take the power back. That's, I mean, it's, I think, a really important point to emphasize, Chris, that you're saying, right, about having a role for everyone in this movement, because of course, as, as important as our unions are, we still only represent something like 10% of the workforce, and so there's 90% of people in this country who need a role, and I think that's, it's hugely important what you're saying there. I, I want to I jump off of that, and it's especially your point about the moment that we're living in and how it might be fleeting, right? This might not last forever, what we're experiencing, um, and the importance of taking militant action while the time is right. Um, President O'Brien, I want to pose this to you. 
um, and bring in kind of your, your second group of white collar uh, crime syndicalists, uh, the, uh, the politicians. Um, with they, they might be number one. They might be number one, right, yeah. I mean, it's, uh, the rankings are constantly fluctuating. Right. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, that's true. Um, so with respect to Chris's point about kind of the moment and, and the opportunity right now, on the one hand, um, or we should say that we've had a National Labor Relations Board over the last couple of years that has been um, good to workers, um, better than at any point in my lifetime, that's for sure. Um, at the same time, we saw a decision from the Supreme Court not long ago, Glacier Northwest, which involved your union, that threatens to make it illegal to strike in this country. Um, so how do, you, I mean, how do you make sense of sort of the political environment that we're up against, the opportunities that workers are creating, um, and what is to be done, the big, big task to be done? I think first and foremost, you know, the NLRB is an antiquated uh, process. And, you know, sorry? Oh. Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry. The um, NLRB is definitely an antiquated process that we try and avoid at all costs. And I think we're doing that uh, through the Amazon campaign right now because our strategy, uh, Chris talked about the DSPs we've got shut down. Um, what we've also been doing is we are not going to go right now the NLRB route to try and uh, determine, you know, a group or to try and organize, uh, to try and uh, get certified because it's a long drawn out process. I mean, I think I said earlier the average statistic to get a f uh, first year contract is about 406 days. Um, and, you know, workers can only sustain so much. And, you know, that process is very litigious. Um, and we think we're more effective, not only with the Amazon portion, but leveraging you know neutrality through direct action so when we're going to organize a new group uh, instead of saying hey go through the process what we've been doing now is gauging how strong this group is um, empowering that we are going to support them and their families uh, during these tough times but are you willing to walk off your job to cause direct action to this company um, and how long can you sustain it so you know, the NLRB has been a lot favorable, but it's still not bulletproof. And, you know, we need to elect people that are not going to just change the leadership of the NLRB, but change the policy of the NLRB, make changes, uh, statutory changes that are actually going to be in effect regardless of who's in control, all for the betterment of work and people. You know, we would love to see, and I think everybody on this uh, stage would love to see the PRO Act, where, you know, Union busting is a $500 million per year industry uh, for, for union busters. And, you know, the PRO Act would obviously give us the ability to organize without any uh, threats of retali retaliation and retribution. So that's why it's important to elect the right people and to ask them the tough questions when they're running for office. Will you support legislation like a PRO Act? The other thing we need to do, I think, um, in the grand scheme of things, outside of, uh, you know, changing uh, the NLRB process, uh, taking direct action, is we need to take a hard look at not investing in our demise. Um, when you really think about it, a lot of our unions, and I, I sit on many pension funds and health and welfare funds, and, you know, those funds are very important. We want them to do well. A lot of those funds are successful based upon contributions uh, made by employers. Uh, but a lot of those funds depend upon investment return. And oftentimes, we don't do a good enough job of seeing what we're actually investing in, like private equity. A lot of private equity that union pension funds and health and welfare funds invest in are investing in direct competition to potentially our demise. They're investing in the Amazons. They're investing in the Uber. They're investing in the Lyfts. They're investing in these companies that have independent contractor models. They're investing in, in, in many things that could hurt us. So we've got to do a better job of also taking a look at where we're investing. And the next thing we need to do is focus on the antitrust laws that need to be uh, revisited uh, and uh, changed, and the bankruptcy laws. Now, everybody's heard of Yellow Freight, where they just filed for bankruptcy, 22,000 Teamster jobs. And that's unfortunate. The, the problem with bankruptcy uh, for, for us as unions is that because of the antiquated laws and the lack of change and the lack of fight and the lack of electing the right people, 
we are the last line of, in, we're last in line if there's anything left at the end of the day to capture on behalf of our members, whether it's owed contributions, whether it's benefits that haven't been paid out, or anything else. So we've got to focus on, you know, many, many different aspects of not just changing the NRB, but looking at bankruptcy laws, looking at where we fall in all this. And that's why it's so important to not only, you know, carry out the missions of leadership, as was spoken about earlier, but also to not invest in our demise and look for change in these bankruptcy laws. It makes it too easy for these companies to file for bankruptcy, close down, give out these big bonuses, and then reopen under another brand uh, in a simple uh, fashion of just trying to break unions. So there's a lot at stake, but a lot of it has to do with setting policy and electing the right people that are going to help set this policy throughout this country. Thanks. Jane, I want to pass it to you to, I mean, broadly on the same topic of, of sort of the political environment. I mean, you, re you referenced the specter of authoritarianism. I think a Supreme Court like the decision like, like Glacier Northwest is, is a reflection of that very specter. Um, and you've organized in right to work states, you've organized in non right to work states, you've organized all over the country. And so can you just talk a little bit about um, how you see what President O'Brien and Chris are talking about? Yeah. Um, you know, one, um, really excited to have uh, the Teamsters going all in uh, to the Amazon fight. I think that's going to be needed, along with collaboration with the independents and several other players who are getting into that business, right? Uh, Amazon is going to be a multi-year, I think, multi-union war. Um, but in addition to that, I, I, I mean, I did write about um, the coming Supreme Court decision uh, that we know is around the corner. Um, they're going to make up for the, 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 the SCOTUS decision around Glacier was essentially just a messy decision. Um, and they are out there looking for a nice, clean Supreme Court decision, either this cycle or next cycle, to functionally try to make all strikes illegal um, in the private sector, um, like they often are in the public sector. So one thing that I think right now is that the better we get at actually getting our members on strike. I mean, a credible strike threat is, I'm all for it, sometimes it works for us. But in my life experience, I come out of a union in 1199 New England that believed in routinely striking, just routinely, because the strike is the way that the members retain the muscle to know how to do it. And when the muscle memory goes away, like you don't just walk back in the gym and like bench press 400 pounds, you actually have to go on strike to actually remember how to go on strike. And so one thing is, if you, if you fast forward really with the Supreme Court, I mean, I said two years ago they were just getting on a tear, and they are really just getting on a tear. They are going to, we, I think we just need to assume, they are going to make the strike illegal, functionally illegal, very, very soon, one cycle or two. They have a lot of priorities of what they're trying to take down at once. <laughs> so I think we have to do uh, it's a measure of our effectiveness when they pay attention to us. Frankly, they just ignored labor unions for so long because we weren't doing anything. We are doing much that threatened the, the status quo of capital, and now we are. Um, I think they're coming for us hard. Um, so the question is, how do we do a hell of a lot of strikes now while they're not quite as legally challenging so that workers actually understand what it's going to take to build to 100% out with full community support because we can do illegal strikes that way. And I'm arguing we better get ready for a hell of a lot of illegal strikes. And in the city of New York, and New York where there's the Taylor Law and all sorts of stuff, um, I think we're way overdue to start testing illegal strikes in so-called blue states. And we ought to be doing it right now. Um, when you watch the West Virginia, When you watch the West Virginia, I mean, look, to win any strike, legal or illegal, it's do you have 100% ready to go and do you have the entire community with you? We know how to do those two things when we put our mind to it. And there's, I, again, I believe there's going to be a lot of illegal strikes needed very, very soon um, because they're going to be that way. So uh, one is prepare for illegal strikes, and that takes twice the strength of what we've got right now. Um, and the second is, I think the labor movement is still fundamentally doing a really poor job about seeing our own members as the community. Like our vehicle to bringing uh, the community with us is less about creating 
labor community coalitions at the top where people write checks to each other and you know you get someone with the priest and the thing and they show up at your picket <laughs> line that is like not the way to build community support though that's what's considered building community support for most of the labor movement right now and it's not enough just to do good messaging though boy does good messaging uh, help we know it does um, as a form of political education but the best political education is when we see our own rank and file members as the central actors, not just at the bargaining table, not just in the organizing, but building what I call the third front for power, which is the broader community in which our members live. It's fundamental. Um, in every campaign I've ever run, we've literally done a two-stage process. Stage one, uh, charting the workplace, understanding leadership relationships, who are the informal leaders in the workplace to get to a very big victory and then get to a first contract in record time. And secondly, the second thing we chart is every single relationship that every rank and file member has to their own community. Who is their parish priest? Who's their rabbi? Who's their imam? And then in delegations, once we chart them by the thousands, we then send those workers in to move the equivalent of the undecided informal leaders in the community who can break the entire community in favor of a coming strike or a coming contract campaign. So I think of that as uh, the book I'm working on now, preview book five, um, is called uh, Leave No Power on the Table. And I think we're still leaving a hell of a lot of power on the table. Um, and maybe it's because I've gone up against some of the biggest SOB union busters in this country from Brent Yesen. If you don't know him, you don't ever want to. <laughs> Beat me up in an elevator once. That was a bad elevator ride. He <laughs> shut the button off on that one. Anyway, I forgot that one. Um, but you know, sexual assault in an elevator by a union buster, that was fun uh, as a young negotiator. Um, and he was doing worse to the registered nurses in the hospitals, by the way. So um, from those kind of union busters, like modern day Pinkertons, y y we are leaving power on the table. And I think what I learned in really hard what we call a level boss fight, meaning there is no, there is not a limit on how much they can spend. There is not a limit on how many workers they fire in the campaign. There is not a limit on how many great people they drag out in handcuffs in the middle of a fight. Who's an identified leader, organic leader in the campaign? What I've learned is that we cannot leave one ounce of power on the table, and one of the biggest untapped parts of the power structure is our broader community and seeing that it's our members who live in the community and themselves have what we call, in sociology I learned at age 45, strong ties versus weak ties. Hiring a staff person to go make relationships with faith leaders has no relationship to organizing the rank and file to go bring their own community into their own fight. It builds unbreakable solidarity and we're gonna need that kind of front row standing up when these strikes become illegal like they were in the 1940s and 50s with like, frankly, the images of the wives on the factories with uh, arms sometimes, and I don't mean their own, I mean additional ones, ready to defend the gates before they even got to the workers. Like that is where we are heading because the capitalists are confused again right now by UAW strategy, like that's good, they're knocked off guard. Um, but that fight's gonna escalate. Um, and I think all of us need to know how to, how to be ready to do the escalation with them and stay 10 steps ahead of them. Yeah, please. So a couple of things, make some great points. Um, Strikes are very effective. Oh. <laughs> Strikes are very effective. Um, you know, there's a lot of risk versus reward uh, whenever you take someone out on the street. And I think we as a union, the Teamsters Union, we strike probably more than anybody, um, or we have lately. Uh, and it's very effective, especially when you're extending picking lines nationwide to help support our brothers and sisters in many different arenas. And, you know, uh, it is true that we could have had a catastrophic uh, impediment on our right to strike through the Glacier decision. However, we didn't view that as a loss. We viewed that as the best of a worst case scenario moving forward. Uh, but again, to your point, it all starts from leadership. So we can hide behind a decision that wasn't favorable to us. We can hide behind and look for excuses on why we can't do certain things. But we've got to be creative. Number one, when we strike, we've got to assess the group and make certain that we're not compromised in any way, shape, or form, because that's going to be the strength and integrity of the strike. 
which is most people are uh, compromised financially, so you've got to be willing to make an investment and support those workers and their families when they're out as leaders. But you also got to lead, and unfortunately in the Glacier situation, um, direction wasn't given as far as what happens when you go on strike. You don't have workers go out to go deliver a product and then call the strike and have them leave the truck sitting running. You go out, finish your job, come back and park the trucks before you come across the line, right? That's the way we were always trained. And, you know, to your point, you have to have good leadership. But in the event, and we were prepared because we thought the worst was going to come with this decision, that in the event you do strike and you are responsible for losses or whatever may occur, um, you've got to be thinking about before you go back to work using your leverage. And the most important tool that we have is withholding our labor. But there is going to be an end in sight at some point in time, whether it's favorable or not. And that's why we would develop a nationwide language in the event that we were going to be on the hook for damages, that we would have nationwide boilerplate language that we would not go back to work without amnesty and hold unions, local unions, international unions harmless. So there always is a will and a way to figure out how to get around certain things. And I'm all for striking. There's no one here that wanted to shut this country down more than I did. But at the end of the day, when you can leverage and you know that you haven't overpromised and underdelivered and you were at where you're at with an 86.3% uh, ratification vote, you know, the, the threat of a strike was very credible and very effective. But to your point, it may not work that way in every single industry. So it all starts from the top and the leadership needs to lead. Just one quick thing, I mean, uh, on the things we should be doing to build on that. I am involved in a huge campaign right now and we are in every single contract starting to bargain that, starting to bargain not that language, but similar but different language and that's basically glacier proofing your contracts now. Um, and everyone should be doing it. It's a couple simple sentences, I'm happy to post them somewhere. Um, we've drafted a bunch of different versions of it, but every single union going to the table needs to make sure they are putting glacier-proof language on, which essentially says this dispute shall not ever go to outside court systems, et cetera. So there's some different ways to write the sentences, and if the boss across the table knows what you're doing, uh, it's going to be hella hard to win, just like co common contract expiration. You've got to be willing to strike to get the language to get glacier-proof now, for whenever the next Supreme Court decision heads. And I think the one other thing that's just as important as amnesty, however it's crafted, yeah. is pick and line protection language that gives you the right to not have to cross pick and lines, uh, whether they are in your industry or not in your industry. We fight all the time with other unions, mostly the building trades who are great friends and great allies, but when we have an issue, they don't have pick and line protection, meaning that they have to cross picket lines. They have to go to work. So there has to be a unified, uniform effort in organized labor to make sure that everybody has picket line protection. You know, when Unite Hair strikes at hotels, Unite Hair strikes wherever else, we as Teamsters, we provide rubbish delivery and pickup, I mean rubbish pickup, liquor delivery, we provide food delivery. We withhold our services because we've got strong language, which further enhances the solidarity and puts pressure on these corporations to settle because they are not getting the goods and services. So outside of the amnesty, we all got to be thinking about pick and line language. Right now, the sag after strike and the Writers Guild strike, the reason why no one's crossing those pick and lines, we have 20,000 Teamsters nationwide that work in the motion picture industry, that does all the trucking, does all the chauffeuring, does anything with wheels as a Teamster on there. We have the strongest picket line protection, which is allowing us to honor those picket lines so no one's going to work. So that's something that we all have to be thinking about and putting our radar screen as leaders. And that's going to be effective if we decide and we have to continuously strike. 
this is why we're called the School of Labor and Urban Studies. I hope everyone's taking notes as you get ready for your next bargaining round. Um, I want to, there's another uh, issue. We've been talking about kind of the, you know, the legal and political context and the opportunities. There's one other issue I want to bring into the conversation um, before we move to Q&A. Um, that's one that you can't miss if you're paying attention these days, which is technology. Um, you, you know, you open the newspaper, you turn on TV, artificial intelligence is somewhere. Um, and so I want to hear from Steve and Chris about how we should think about this. Steve is a scholar of technology and labor um, and is thinking a lot about this. And Chris, I know as you're strategizing around Amazon, technology is always on the mind. So Steve, could you maybe start by walking us through, I mean, what, like, I'm a labor historian, and when you read labor history, you, the, the idea that the robots are coming and taking all the jobs has been around for a long time. Um, on the other mm -hmm. hand, I got on ChatGPT a couple weeks ago, and I was like, this is scary. <laughs> so uh, yeah, how, how, are the robots coming, or are they not? Or how should we make sense of it? And then, <laughs> then, Chris, I want to go to you to talk Jane, about Jane's looking at me like, yeah, Steve, what's going to happen? <laughs> yeah. uh, like, um, so you know, this is what capitalism does, right? Is it, it takes profit, it invests it in machines to reduce the amount of labor it needs or remove the need for expensive labor, um, right? And, and this, this process is, is happening uh, continually. But, you know, uh, in my work, the, the point that I've tried to make it are really two important points that I think have been lost. Um, one is that no technology necessarily has uh, an inherent set of consequences for labor, right? Uh, policy, it's contingent. It's contingent on labor power and it's contingent on policy. And I'll just use the, um, well, let me, let me cover the, the second point, which is we have been giving a free pass to technology companies uh, on the consequences of the, what they're developing um, as owners of that technology. All of the stuff that, I don't have my cell phone on me, um, but all this stuff that is disruptive right now, most of it was paid for with our public dollars. Okay, so self-driving trucks, you know, this is, this is a defense department program that started decades ago, which relied on billions of dollars in public investment in artificial intelligence, et cetera. The, the package delivery apps that we're seeing right now, the most important program to that transformation was the Navy's development of global positioning system. Okay, this is all, you know, public dollars, national hardware, right, up in space. Um, that now, you know, Silicon Valley comes in when it's time to commercialize it. Now that 95% of the investment has been done, uh, you know, in public universities, et cetera, and says, well, now we're going to, you know, figure out how we can replace labor or make jobs worse or get cheaper, you know, uh, cheaper labor in to do this work. We need to start owning, taking back our right as the public to, to these technologies and its consequences and recognize that. You know, it's really going to be policy that determines the, and labor power that determines the outcome of that. And I'll give you the example um, of this perfect example is, you know, UPS, right? They, they have, they're a very te technologically sophisticated company. Uh, you know, the, your package car driver is carrying around a, a scanner um, that could speed up the work that could, you know, push them to deliver faster, that could, you know, with the Orion system they developed, try to, you know, de-skill the work and have that worker directed turn by turn, right? It has not had the consequence there that it has had in the Amazon DSP, where the, the drivers are dependent on that turn by turn package, you know, uh, sequence um, and, and the direct monitoring and direction of their, of their behavior um, by that app because of the Teamsters Union, right? Which has determined how that technology has, has played out. So we've got to get out of this mode of, you know, is technology, you know, going to wipe out all the jobs or are we going to get run over by technology and figure out how are we going to turn technology into something that's going to increase organizing opportunities, that's going to make jobs better, that's going to raise wages, right? Um, make workers more product productive, but make sure that they get their cut of that productivity and, and the value that they're bringing. And central to that is, is policy, right? And we have to recognize that the rules that get set out, and, and this is where, you know, when we talk about nothing being left on the table, 
in terms of collaboration and power um, for organizing. Logistics workers are great because they, they move through public spaces, they use public infrastructure, right, and they link workplaces together. And the Teamsters are the number one example of this, and this is why there have been laws passed forever, locally, federally, to control Teamster power, right, is because they've, they've linked together workplaces so, so effectively and been such a threat to, to capital. When we talk about this revolution of last mile delivery where we're taking the billions of hours that all of us spend going out shopping into jobs, this is a, this is a transformational, um, you know, this is a revolution in our landscapes, in our cities, in our way of life. These, these package, you know, delivery vehicles are gonna be parked on our streets. They're gonna be, you know, stopping at the crosswalks while our kids are getting out of school. Right, um, they're going to be affecting our ability to fight climate change. Right, they're going to, you know. So when we think about, you know, the city, the state, etc., there are all kinds of levers. We all have skin in this game, right? This isn't a private factory that's going to bring in some robots, right? This is our roadways. This is our neighborhoods, right? Um, and this is we're the motoring public, right? And we've got to start owning that you know, our right to those things and building those broader coalitions where we say, you know what, City Hall um, or, uh, you know, Business Owners Association, et cetera, like, you know, these are our, this is our infrastructure. We're paying for the roads, you know? That, that's, you know, that's my minivan over there with my kids in it, you know? Um, and, and I think that's uh, an area of growing power and potential power because of these logistics workers who are gonna be coming to our doors, uh, you know, more and more frequently. Chris, you want to? Yeah, yeah, I'll just jump right in. I mean, I think you know, there's there's no slowing down of technology, right? But there is something that we can do, and President Bryan spoke about it. Is we can control the way technology is used in unionized workplaces through negotiations and a collective bargaining agreement. Whereas on the other hand, you have places like Amazon, who have all control. It is run as a dictatorship, and technology is used on many different levels. Not only is it used for for production standards. But you know, quite frankly, they, they use it to spy, right? I mean, they they use it to comb through people's social media accounts to see who's organizing. They use it as heat maps in their facilities to find out where people are getting together and finding out if they're moving in masses to have certain meetings, right? Technology can be used in a completely different way too. And, and in this context, it's out of control, right? And but I'll tell you, it's also a motivator, right? Because we use it as an agitator. Right, to these workers that are going in these places with unrealistic production standards, right, with no bathroom breaks, no access to water. I know those are health and safety issues, but these are all agitational issues. That nobody wants to go to work and feel like they're micromanaged. Not, not do they go in and give a hell of a day's work, you know, to get put through the meat grinder, but also have to be micromanaged and watched every step of the way, right? And workers are starting to see this, and they're uprising over these issues starting to see that the use of these technologies are really affecting the, the way they work. And there have been a couple studies that actually talk about what does that do to the mindset? What is that doing to the psyche of people that are going into these workplaces and dealing with these issues and the depression and things that it's causing? So I mean, I think that's definitely something that we need to uh, address. And I think we need to address it in an antitrust level as well, right? Because some of the <coughs> things that they're doing in the surveillance, and they, they're quite frankly using a lot of this technology to um, prohibit people for exercising their Section 7 rights. And, and not only that, all the other issues that come along with it. So, um, you know, there's, there's two ways it can goes, go, I think. I, I don't think we're ever gonna slow it down, but I think we can control it in the process that we have, and I think it's proven that we can do that. Now we've gotta lead the others to see that and, and agitate and move towards collective action. Yeah, please. All right, so the technology aspect, and you know, we, we actually, uh, combated that very well under a unionized contract at UPS, but what do we do for the people that don't have the ability to be protected under a union contract? We've got to take it to the state legislature, we've got to take it to a national level. Now technology is, is, is very sexy, it's very convenient, whatever that may be, um, and I think we have a society of convenience right now where people hit that send button and they want their package or they want their product that next day. But let's not lose sight of the fact technology is a jobs killer. It's a middle class jobs killer. You know, everybody that wants to fall in love with these autonomous vehicles and autonomous tractor trailers, um, you know, we're gonna lose potentially hundreds of thousands upon millions of middle class jobs. So we've gotta fight under the union contracts to protect 
all these jobs from being replaced. We can embrace technology that may do away with jobs that you know, we've been doing for a long time, but you have to have an ability. There's got to be some human element that we'll be able to replace and work along with technology that will maintain that standard of living at, at a higher middle class wage. Um, but you also have to look at the public safety risk. You look at this artificial intelligence, right, which is, I think, our brothers and sisters at the WGA, sag after. we're fighting on, on it in many different industries we represent, and I'm sure you all are. We're scared of it, and we should be. We've got to make certain that the public understands what the risk is with all this automation and artificial intelligence. For instance, I am a fourth generation truck driver. I drove tractor trailers all over this country, hauled equipment. I know that my instinct is a lot better than a robot. I know that my gut instinct is going to make me react that much more quicker, and my training is going to allow me to not be a public safety risk out there. And I think that's the narrative we need to say when we're talking about autonomous tractor trailers throughout this country. We also talked about infrastructure. We all made huge investments. Our grandchildren, future grandchildren, and great-grandchildren will be paying for these advancements. If you are going to link three tractor trails together driven by a robot, that's 40 tons going down that road pounding day in and day out as fast as it can go, which we're going to be actually destroying the investment we made in the infrastructure. But most importantly, the public safety issue, the risk. You know, if you're driving down the road with a family of four, and you've got a tractor trailer, and you've got, you've seen bank accounts get hacked, you've seen your debit cards get hacked. You don't think these computers and these robots can be hacked in these tractor trailers or these autonomous vehicles where they could cause tremendous damage and risk thousands upon thousands of lives on a daily basis? And then you look at other things, tractor trailer drivers. When I was taught how to drive a tractor trailer, the one thing we would talk about is always be aware of your situation, your surroundings. If you're driving down the road and you see a highway patrolman or a state trooper, life in danger, you pull over and help. You think a robot's going to be able to do that? In the trucking industry right now, we have a national push and a national uh, narrative, and I think we all know it's a major problem, human trafficking. Human trafficking is done at truck stops. It's done uh, all around commercial drivers and vehicles. We are helping aid to end human trafficking. Is that going to happen with robots and or technology? No, it's not. So these are the arguments that we need to do. But more importantly, outside all those issues, it's a job killer. And we have to recognize that. And we all have an obligation. How many people go to a supermarket and they're in a rush and they go through self-checkout? How many people do that right now? I refuse to do that. I don't care if the line's 10 miles long because you're putting someone out of work because of technology. So we all have an obligation. As I said earlier, let's not invest in our demise. Let's not embrace just the society of convenience without realizing what potential consequences could be. We have to think long and hard. And look, I'm the most impatient person in the world for, with everything. When I hit that button, I want it yesterday, but I want to make sure where it's coming from and who it's delivering, and we want humans doing that work. Jane, you want to? Yeah, I think just, just one thing to note is, you know, if you look at the Unite Here strike going on in Los Angeles, and Unite Here led early in the Boston fight, uh, by the way, in 2018. Um, they led really early on checking the role of technology and forcing negotiations around it through a massive strike um, in Boston. Um, and they're doing it again right now in Los Angeles, and they're rotating strike, roving strike, roving strike. Uh, you've got SAG-AFTRA and the writers and hotels right now on strike, basically trying to stop really awful technology. Um, what's interesting is the UAW strike has a whole different challenge with technology, which is we desperately need the technological change that is going to get us out of the fossil fuel business. And so what's challenging to me is watching the complete failure and the environmental or climate justice movement, like wrapping themselves in the UAW fight right now. That is what's needed because we need to get out of the business of fossil fuel if we're gonna have life on the planet for any of us. But we cannot expect that to happen in the transition to electric vehicles 
unless, seriously, and until all those jobs are guaranteed union. And frankly, that's on Biden, and that's on the administration right now, and that's on an environmental and climate move that, that while it is making some progress understanding the role of the working class in the fight to save the planet, it's not getting there fast enough, speaking of leadership change. We need some like big environmental organizations that frankly should be weighing in like nobody's business right now, surrounding and embracing the UAW struggle and demanding that every single electric vehicle job and battery plant is going union coming out of this UAW strike. And shy of that, it's going to be very hella hard to win. So there's like technology we have to stop as a trade union movement and technology that we have to fight for. And it's going to take a lot of strength. And we are like absent in that fight right now. I just, if I could just follow up on that. So, you know, the, you're 100% right as far as capturing as much work, uh, especially through uh, technology and, and the, the electric vehicles are coming. I think everybody's utilizing them. Um, but the one struggle, uh, and we always look at where our strengths are, the one struggle in any fight is the union density of that union. That's right. So, like for our fight at UPS, we're 100% teams to unionize throughout the entire country. We're, even in the right to work states, we hold about 93% membership uh, mm -hmm. in this unit. The struggle, and this is where we all have to be smart leaders moving forward, is making certain that we are protecting our existing work, uh, especially on a union contract, but capturing that union density, to your point, of the new technology and new plants to get what we call card check neutrality throughout all these agreements uh, so that in the event they do open up a plant um, within uh, South Carolina. I heard uh, Nikki Haley bragging on Cavuto the other day how she is a staunch union buster and she would welcome any additional work from the big three because they have, do have uh, automaker plants there. Um, so that's another thing that we have to focus on as leaders is making sure that whatever we negotiate that we provide and demand opportunity to organize uh, in the non-union as well, um, which is going to be huge moving forward because whatever deal is reached, it's only successful if you can capture and maintain that work moving forward. And the standards, right? It's like capture the work with the standards we expect. Yeah. Great. Um, I want to move us into the Q&A section of our discussion. Um, we, have, we had a number submitted in advance, so I'm going to start with a couple of those. But I think all of you have um, sheets of paper as well on your tables. If you've had a chance to write one down or um, uh, if you get a chance to, it sometimes is helpful because a lot of people have similar questions, so I can kind of classify some together. And then I think we will also try to, um, uh, we have a mic here so we can get to a few of those. Who are, but if you've written them down, it would be really helpful for just um, moderating this process. Um, so one question we have that was submitted early from Luis um, is about sectoral organizing and bargaining. He, he writes, have you all thought about what a sectoral organizing strategy um, would look like to take on Amazon? This is a concept that's been kind of a hot term in the labor movement over the last few years. Um, and, uh, and so anyone, this is open to anyone. I mean, what we make of sectoral bargaining as a concept, as a strategy, a strategic approach. Um, I just want to put it on the table. We're dealing with logistics, which is, a, as Steve sort of set up for us at the outset, a complex and big uh, sector. So um, I'll, I'll open this up to whoever wants to take it. This is from, uh, was submitted by Luis. Go gives a good answer, I'll take credit for it. <laughs> <laughs> one, I don't know which yeah. <laughs> No, uh, s sectoral um, and, uh, and how that plays out in context of the U.S. Uh, uh, you know, I, have, I honestly, I haven't given it much thought, but just kind of thinking it through in, in the way that we operate under the laws that we do, I'm not just so sure that uh, sectoral um, organizing is, is going to work, right? I mean, I think we've tried it in just partnerships and just on a, a, a lower level of, of partnerships and creating coalitions, right, and bringing ideas and movements to tables, it, it's very difficult to, to get people on the same page and moving in the same direction, right? I mean, you can see it, we talk about in the context of Amazon. 
right? We've seen the strategies that were taken, and I agree there's no silver bullet, but just getting people on the same page, moving in the same direction, direction trying to accomplish the same goal has been extremely difficult even on a, on a micro level, never mind on a large scale macro level where you're looking at, you know, everyone getting on the same page and moving in the same direction. I mean, I think first we need to focus on coalition building and getting on the same page and, and trying to have someone like the Teamsters lead the fight with partnerships behind us to spread out throughout the country. I, I think it's a global issue as well because, you know, um, you know, we have a lot of global partners. I think we have 118 for the Teamsters transportation unions uh, throughout the world. And, um, but, you know, our laws aren't as good as some other countries and, and some other areas in this world, uh, which gives us, you know, we're at a disadvantage. But, um, and the relationships are different. Um, a lot of these European companies have good relationships with employers because they have to, you know, adhere to stricter, uh, more consequential laws for workers where, you know, we partner up and they say they're going to help and, you know, they are effective in certain areas, but it all comes back to what we're going to do in the states and what, what is going to support us and what is going to hurt us. And, you know, I think the strategy at Amazon that we've used that's been effective, not only, you know, the worker-to-worker -worker communication, which is extremely effective, like we talked about earlier, showing them what you get when you work under a union contract, but it's the community building portion that's the most important. You know, Amazon has a record of 150% turnover ratio. They have targeted uh, low-income neighborhoods to build a lot of their facilities, and they just recycle people in and out. Um, we, what we've been successful in doing around the country, not in every area, um, is making sure that we go to local, town, city government, make sure that they're passing ordinances and or resolutions that will mandate you, uh, Amazon um, uphold industry standards, which those industry standards are usually dictated by the UPS or DHL, uh, landlocking a lot of these folks, so putting direct, uh, direct uh, pressure on Amazon is how we're going to do it. I mean, at the end of the day, there is no uh, set strategy that's going to be foolproof. Again, like I talked about earlier, when we're organizing Amazon, it's got to be a plan, a strategy, execute that strategy. But if that strategy isn't working, we've got to pivot and move and, and start you know, looking at other ways to do it. Uh, the global partnerships are great, but sometimes they're not as effective as we think they are. Yeah. Maybe just one more. Anybody here? Uh, go ahead. One more uh, quick word on that. I, I have had the pleasure of doing a ton of work now outside of the US. Um, uh, uh, and certainly in Germany. Um, and there's some Germans here, I'll, they could speak for themselves, but they've schooled me very well in the uh, limitations of sectoral negotiations, quite frankly. And I think the way it's talked about in the United States, both uh, Germany as sort of Schengen law, which sorry it's not, um, in terms of labor law, but also the laws that have actually been, sort of the proposals that have been written in the US to get to sectoral bargaining, uh, to me have so far been shortcuts. It's as if we get sectoral bargaining and we don't have to organize and strike. The truth is, even if you have sectoral bargaining laws, you must continue to exercise the strike muscle or you're just gonna get a weak sectoral deal. So you can have a crappy sectoral agreement or you can have a really strong one. And the UAW in the 1940s and 50s in this country was doing sectoral bargaining without a law, right? You took the sector, you sat down, you lined up your contracts, um, and you went. And the union I came out of, lines up every nursing home contract and long-term care contract in New England, will strike to get the same common expiration date, and it's effectu effectively sectoral bargaining, right? So it can be weak or strong. It's all about are the workers empowered and enabled uh, to do what they need to do when they need to do it, uh, which is actually exercise the strike muscle, sectoral or not. Well, I, I think, um, you know, in addition to the, you know, comments on sectoral bargaining, which I completely uh, agree with, you know, the, the sector-wide stuff, we do need to do a lot of sector-wide stuff. It's great that we have, a, you know, an excellent contract in a big part of parcel um, that, you know, workers can see and see the value of, of what, what that brings. Um, President O'Brien mentioned, what do we do for these 
you know, folks who are not um, unionized. And, and there we need to really think about how we're going to raise that floor. And I'll give you the one example is just the health and safety concerns of this algorithmic management for delivery. I talk to drivers all the time um, for DSPs. Many of them are actually trained to jog from, from the truck up to, up to a house. Right um, now, they're new to the work. They don't understand that, you know. You might be able to do that for a week, a month, right, um, without getting hurt. But if you're going to make a career out of package delivery uh, in Worcester, Massachusetts, in winter, <laughs> you know, you can't jog to the door, right? And so people are being pushed by this algorithmic management, and we're seeing, you know, phenomenal rates of, of injury and stuff. Like that, that's somewhere where across the sector we should have, we should be passing laws. Right about what what you're able to do to workers and put them at risk. Right to to eliminate these things. Um, similarly, we get you know all this interaction right between uh, UPS, FedEx, the DSPs, and most importantly now the U.S. Postal Service. Right, letter carriers are coming up for a contract negotiation. Um, you know, and they're going to need a, a lot of support. They're under more restrictions, right, uh, by their by law. Than, than, than other unions, right? And so we need to be organizing across those, those services. The good thing in logistics is there aren't that many of them, <laughs> right? It's pretty concentrated. And so it's, it's a little simpler than in some other places in transportation where you got a thousand different actors, or, you know, fly-by-night companies, et cetera. And so we really need to strengthen those sectoral-wide um, relationships. I think, well, so a rule of mine in, in these is uh, first questions go, get to go, go to students or uh, recent, recent graduates. So I got a question here from Natalie, which is actually echoed by a few others. Um, and it's kind of, I think, nicely jumps off of this um, topic, which is about the, the averted rail strike last year. Um, I know it's on a lot of people's minds and how we're all thinking about it, so I just want to pose it to the group. Um, uh, it, it, it came up in several questions, so I'll try to synthesize the essence of it, which is how did the resolution of the rail strike affect the Teamsters' thinking and going into UPS, how, and how should it, um, and, and how should the political response and, and political crisis around it affect how we think about Amazon and other logistics industry organizing going forward? Well, I think just so everybody's clear about the rail strike, uh, or the potential for the rail strike. We represent the BLET, which is the train uh, locomotive engineers, and the BMWED are the folks that uh, install, repair, and maintain the infrastructure that the trains are on. Um, that is, and I think it's the uh, whole industry was represented by about 17 different international unions doing, um, you know, various uh, trades. Um, but. You know, people were fast to criticize why there wasn't a strike in the rail division. Now, everybody I think that knows the Railway Labor Act is basically uh, governed by Congress. And it's a process that's antiquated. It's a never-ending process uh, if you can't get a deal. And at that point in time, when you come to uh, uh, a stalemate, so to speak, that's when uh, mediation occurs and the uh, Congress can enact, which they did, uh, the PEB, which the board's recommendation. Now, I just want to give a little insight to, you know, the current administration obviously gets criticized quite a bit, um, but this process of bargaining with the railroads started under the Trump administration. And we were able to leverage, when we got into office, our political in a short time period, our influence to get the White House to agree to a uh, presidential emergency board fast-tracked, meaning that you know, the mediation process went through, uh, the arbitration process, and the arbitrator, the two out of the three arbitrators determined what the process would be. Uh, and again, if there was further impasse, then Congress had to ability to implement the contract. Now, we were influential in getting that fast tracked as a Teamsters Union on behalf of the other unions represented. Um, so it's a very, very intricate process. And all through the process, there was concern nationwide that a nationwide rail strike would throw the country into a recession, which was realistic because, again, we talk about indirect uh, issues that may occur because of a strike. 
you know, you would have had a lot of logistics like UPS and FedEx and Amazon who depend a lot about their freight getting moved on the rails, getting pulled off by trucks and delivered to these centers. Wasn't going to happen. So there would have been, you know, a lot of consequences as a result of it. But, you know, at the end of the day, if that's what had to happen, it was necessary to happen to make sure that these workers got what they wanted. Fortunately, through the, I think if you look at a positive out of a negative situation, there was a lot of criticism on why the railroads didn't strike. There was a lot of criticism of the administration for <laughs> putting that vote to Congress. But it actually highlighted one of the major problems uh, in the railroad industry was paid time off for families, which wasn't achieved during the, uh, the um, mediation and or the arbitration that was awarded and implemented by Congress. Uh, but it put a real, real bad light on the carriers for not, for not providing paid time off and disciplined people for utilizing any type of paid time off. So we had a meeting actually last week at our general executive board meeting where because of the public pressure, because of the stockholders, because of the boards being involved, what we weren't able to achieve through the process under the RLA is now being achieved in negotiations one-on-one uh, -on -one with these carriers and the locals throughout the country because we put such a heightened alert on the, on the issue of paid time off that now our members in the railroad are getting sick time, they are getting paid time off, and they're not getting disciplined for using it. So if there's any negative or uh, positive that can come out of the negative, Look, if we don't always get what we want, especially through that process, once we highlight and that resonates with people, I think right now, compared to 20 or 30 years ago, uh, family life quality is very important, and everybody recognizes that. So, you know, that was one of the narratives, and I think we were successful in achieving that, even though it's an antiquated process that I believe needs to be uh, revisited as well. I mean, I, I just quickly on that, <clears throat> there was a moment where uh, any number of us, I think, <laughs> should have given a little administration uh, tutorial on how to negotiate. Because in fact, there was a moment where all Biden had to do was say, you got about 14 days to deliver like 21, 21 days of sick time or we're gonna unleash them. And in, in a similar way, um, Sean, that you described that you were making it UPS's choice to strike you. I think it was a really blundered opportunity on the part of Biden to not extract 14, which was the demand, I would have said 21 paid sick days um, that these workers could use anytime they want, and counted the clock down on the bosses and said 14 days, we're either gonna let the workers walk or you're actually gonna do this. So. Um, it's, it's good to know that little by little it's happening, um, but back to the sectoral question and back to the uses of power and that the guy who keeps saying he's the most pro-union president has yet to really actually demonstrate it. And that moment was not a good uh, one for us, I don't think. And listen, I just may respond to that. Look, everybody's entitled their opinions, um, but when the Biden administration took over outside of the uh, rail situation, uh, under the Trump administration, there was a real pandemic going on. That was the potential for pension funds to collapse throughout this entire country, not just Teamster pension funds, but there were 200 pension funds throughout this country that were critical and declining. And under the Biden administration, under the Trump administration, we tried to pass Butch Lewis, which would have you know, made these pension funds solvent for 30 years under the same plan that was proposed under the Biden administration Long story short is, look, we're not thrilled with a lot of decisions that the administrations make, but I will say this on behalf of the Teamsters Union and my retirees and active members, uh, for the next 30 years, because Biden lived up to one of his promises that said he was gonna fix pension funds throughout this country, that I know my mother, who my father died suddenly 12 years ago, doesn't have to worry about her pension because it's solidified for the next 30 years. And again, you know, that's just, a demonstration on, hey, maybe Biden's not doing this in this arena, but we can't lose sight of the fact that what he did for 300 pension funds that could have been insolvent and people wouldn't have got paid and they would have been subject to the uh, pension benefit guarantee that may have given a maximum of $1,100 per month. So 
I, not that I want to debate it, but I do have to call balls and strikes. He has done some good stuff for working people. Oh, I, I don't, he's got a few good strikes. Good Steve, you wanted to say well, something. Well, I, right? I, just, I just wanted to, you know, take a step back and, and think about, you know, this, this transformation in logistics, right? Um, the, the Railway Act, right? The, the specific laws, Landrum, Griffith, and some others that are, were, you know, meant to diminish Teamster power. You know, all this is, a, is because logistics workers have so much potential power that has, you know, been eroded by, you know, law and policy for, you know, since the railroad strikes in the 1870s, right? And we got to think about ways to get some of that back because, I mean, that's why we're having this, you know, debate right now about these things and is because, you know, logistics workers have so much structural power, right? And, and, you know, we can utilize that once we have public support, once we have, you know, greater momentum uh, to, to rebuild the union movement, like we need to free up more of that power and use it more, more effectively because it's, it's frankly tremendous, right? They're the connective tissue of the economy. And it's worth noting that the Railway Labor Act was passed in 1926 after some big railroad strikes that struck a lot of fear in the hearts of the governing uh, class in this country um, almost 100 years ago. Uh, Okay, I got another, this question also came up in a few different forms, and this is from John, a current student of ours. Um, so I'm gonna bring a few together for this. And, and it's a question I know that's also on a lot of people's mind, which is how to, how to um, move the labor movement, and especially unions with substantial resources, to take advantage of the organic organizing that's going on all over the place. Um, John writes, how do, how do we get unions with large coffers and or organizing infrastructure to support organizations fighting to unionize, um, and how important is community organizing to unions? It's from John. Yeah, and I, I, think, I think this kind of goes hand in hand, right? I mean, we've got to do start at a very basic grassroots level and start with education. Right, it's fundamentally unionization education has been lost. I know my kids, the, the last time they talked about uh, a labor union was in third grade. I remember my little guy coming home and saying, yeah, Dad, we talked about unions today and I told him you were a teamster and he was all excited, right? <laughs> but that was it, right? And, and like as Sean alluded to earlier, that you know, that generational knowledge passed down generation, generation at the dinner table, at cookouts, at things of that nature, have been lost. So we've got to get back to the fundamentals of education, outreach, connecting with community partners, and having these discussions to start to educate the masses so then we can harness that energy and move towards collective action and shutting it down, taking the power back. Yes. All right, yeah, that's well said. <laughs> well, I think we could take maybe one or two Maybe one, depending on how long it goes, one or two from the mic, if any, is there any, any open hands? I know a few, I didn't get to a few, so if you wrote one down I didn't get to you and you wanna pose it at the mic. Um, I tried to cluster the ones that came in in groups, but there's a few that are really good questions, and so if anyone would like to. We'd encourage also if there's students who haven't asked questions and they would like to ask that um, we prioritize uh, student questions. Thanks. Um, yeah, my name is uh, Luigi from Germany. I'm, I'm working as an organizer in different sectors, mainly hospitals, but also uh, public sector bargaining. Uh, and um, I wanted to ask a question because uh, this year, it's the 10th anniversary of um, the first strike at Amazon in Germany. Amazon has created 20, um, the big centers, oh, what's? Uh, Hubs? No, no, not the fulfillment, fulfillment centers. Uh, since uh, for, this was the first inroad into the German market and then the last three years, they are starting also to create um, the, uh, the chains until the last mile before they relied on the the DHL um, to deliver uh, the last mile. And so um, the organizing process in Germany started a bit by accident. Just one or two organizers in one or two places started to connect to workers that have had grievances and then started to organize. And um, there is now a base of several thousand members, also like 
reproducing itself and being able to strike, but it's um, the way that Amazon has, has um, learned how to deal with the strike, because it's a strike only like in eight of the 20 fulfillment center and none of the last mile facilities. And so they can reroute and they are experts in rerouting. And so um, my question is, um, how do we not fall into the trap of like starting an organizing process um, in one or two facilities, but on the whole of the company, uh, and in this way prevent the rerouting, uh, which the logistic revolution is all about, like redundancy and so on. And um, uh, what's your plan uh, for, for Amazon in, in the US? And uh, because um, in Germany it's a bit stalled, the organizing drive, because Amazon has, uh, has learned a lot about it. First, thank you for taking the time to be here. It's been very enriching, uh, mainly for you, Chris and Sean. Your organizing and your successes have been primarily concerned with the private sector. So I'm curious what insights you could share and the rest of our panelists uh, of what we could glean for public sector organizing. Well, I don't know if that's accurate because we are razor shop focused on we're razor shop focused on organizing both in the private sector and the public sector. I'm not sure you're aware of this, but the third largest uh, block of our membership is public sector. And we obviously saw what happened with the Janus decision. Um, and that was a perfect example of not making the right choices politically where we actually invested in some cases in our demise in the public sector. Uh, but with that said, um, we have been organizing in the public sector nationwide. I think uh, we've got a lot of, a lot of public universities uh, that are now organizing uh, with us. Uh, but the most important thing to organize in the public sector is to have the strongest contracts in the public sector, as I spoke about earlier, and point out. And the one thing that we don't do good enough in a labor union, I think we're getting better at it, not just the Teamsters, but in general, is we get a bargaining unit, we get them a contract, we get comfortable, we don't enforce it. And when you're not enforcing a contract, no matter how good it is, then you're not doing a service to people that may not be working under a contract, especially in the public sector, to you know, want to join the union. So we've been doing a, a focused on the education portion of it, the enforcement, but also identifying potential targets within the public sector that aren't represented that give us the right under the law to organize them. So we are dialed in uh, strong on the public sector. We think, actually, we think it's probably one of our uh, greatest opportunities to grow uh, is in the public sector. Great. We're going to take one quick question, and you all will kick it to you to answer, respond to anything. Hi. Um, my name is Ramallah. I'm a part of the union semester program, and I wanted to get y'all's thoughts on um, minority unionism. I think it's like a practice that like some unions like the United Electrical Workers or Union is doing. I think the alphabet workers in, um, what is it, Apple are doing, and I just wanted to hear what y'all think about that. Well, I mean, diversity is, is a key priority for labor unions. Uh, I know I can speak for the Teamsters Union. Uh, we are probably one of the most diverse unions because we organize in every sector throughout the country. There's a joke that if a fire hydrant could be organized, the Teamsters Union would get them to sign a card. Um, so diversity is very important uh, in our industry. And look, the, the, the faces of the American workers are changing, you know, so we've got to embrace diversity, but more importantly, promote it, not just on the rank and file level, but on the leadership level as well. Can I ask a quick question on that? Was the I think that if I'm if I'm not wrong, I think the question was about the strategy of yeah, yeah. not minority in the context of diversity, but that. minority of, of sort of the militant minority. Yes. Yeah. Um, so uh, <laughs> that's a big topic to ask at the end. Um, <laughs> really big, brother. We could be here for hours on that one, but. Uh, um, I don't personally. Uh, embrace it um, because I think that some of the folks who are engaged in this concept of uh, the militant minority um, often themselves fail to embrace the concept of building majoritarian um, support inside of the workplace 
And there is no way in hell for any of us who have negotiated contracts and led strikes to believe that only like 20% of the workers walking out is going to get the same, first of all, they're going to get their ass fired in this country, but there's no way that a militant minority is going to do better than a militant, fired up, supermajority going after their employer. That's, that's, now, that's the beginning of a long article that's coming out of me soon. Well, I think, so, we, nego I think, I think we negotiate contracts and represent workers uh, so that everybody is treated equally and fairly. Whether, you know, I think to your point, the entire group, regardless of anything else, especially if you're going to strike, needs to be militant, needs to be walking one direction, one mission, that's to get the best contract equally for everybody. Right, well, I, I wanted to jump in on this too, but I do think a militant minority can be used to gain momentum in a fight. Mm -hmm. yeah. right? Sometimes we have to build a militant minority to take ownership and come out with public support and take ownership of whatever effort they're trying to change in order to attract new folks. But also, we have also seen that in militant minority actions, that real change can take place. We've seen it in many locations, speaking specifically to Amazon, where minority workers, or minority of workers, have marched on the boss and made demands, and they've conceded to those demands. So there is a place for it, and it can start there. But if we're gonna get to a collective bargaining agreement, That's right. we need a militant majority. That's right. And just before we wrap it, I, I you know we had a question from our organizer from Germany about uh, you know the challenge that they've encountered with Amazon there, if anyone wants to take a stab at that. Well, you one. asked about the strategy, right? I can't tell you the strategy <laughs> because we don't want it out in the street, right? <laughs> but you know there is a plan in place. And you know the tough part for us, I, I know that we've faced with Amazon and to your point, you know, they, they're very mobile. Logistics, they know how to operate, they know how to move, and I think what you're alluding to is, in Germany, they ran from the strength, right? Well, the good thing about the United States is we've pinpointed where their strong points are and where they can't run from and where they have set up shop, and they have set up shop just like FedEx has and DHL and UPS. They're all within proximity of each other. So I'll give you a little tidbit of strategy that we are focusing on the large metropolitan areas where they can't run and where they have to do business, where we think we have leverage and we'll have the ability, and on the states that have strong uh, language like California laws that support workers. Um, so that is part of the strategy. And look, it's like anything else. We, and look, we believe we're the only union that can represent Amazon. I don't mean that disrespectfully in the package delivery business. We have a pr proven, pr proven track record with UPS, we've represented them for over 80 years, um, got the strongest contracts. So, you know, we do have a template and a um, ability to organize and represent them. But to your point is, you know, they can run, but they can't hide. All we need is one big victor in a major metropolitan city, and that's going to be the template that we take nationwide. Uh, and we think we're going to be able to do that. But to your point, it's not going to happen tomorrow. I mean, this is a, a five, six year process that could have many trials and tribulations that we're going to have to change and adapt to. Uh, but if I gave you the strategy, I know like, listen, I have a saying that if you tell a Teamster a secret, it's no longer going to be a secret. <laughs> so we don't tell anything. Uh, any closing remarks, Chris, Jane, or Steve? Yeah, just, just in general, um, I, I think the whole basis comes down to work of power getting back on a grassroots level, engaged in the shop floor, educating, mobilizing, and provoking workers to take direct action to make demands and, and, and change and empower people. And that empowerment and that change can be effective, uh, effective, right? But we also need engagement from every one of you. We need everybody on every different level engaged in these fights, having these conversations, moving their electeds, meeting with their community groups, talking to their churches, we need to be talking about this to everyone, right? We need to be making assessments of who's gonna be on board, who's with us. And, and I'm asking you all today to get involved, right? Participate in any, any level that you can. There, there's workers out there right now that are on strike, that are fighting for their lives, they're fighting for their livelihoods, they're fighting for change, but they're not only fighting for those 84 people that are out there on the street, they're fighting for the industry. Because if we can make change with those 84 workers,
and we can see change, and we, we make a difference, we know we can do it everywhere else. And it's up to us to keep those people afloat. I'll tell you, Amazon has money. We're never gonna compete with the money that they have. But if we have the people, we can move anything. And that's what we gotta get back to, is the people. So we're gonna have some people outside, uh, a couple of my, my brother Teamsters out there, handing out flyers. Please, take a flyer, scan it, get involved in any capacity you can. Whether, you know, we, we have a, uh, a strike fund set up for these workers, if you can donate a buck a month, great. If you can help on a, uh, on a Sunday, taking some action, great. If you know somebody that people are putting some work, great. We have a spot for everybody. Get involved. Oh, I mean, I just quickly reiterate the uh, building the third front for power, um, which is the one least often attended to um, since about the ninth, since McCarthyism, um, which is actually how we look at our workers as whole workers who have a set of concerns outside the workplace that are just as intense and deep as the concerns they have at work. Um, and it's to our detriment, I think, as a labor movement that we only focus on addressing the crisis of workers at work. Um, when if we begin to address the crisis of the working class more broadly, I think we generate leads. My life experiences, having built a tenant union accidentally in the middle of a fight to unionize a bunch of workers, the way that we generated more new organizing leads was by seeing, was by realizing that once people saw us stop the demolition and gentrification of a bunch of public housing units in Connecticut years ago, we literally had people like walking into our office saying, we want one of those too. Um, so the more we went on issues outside of the workplace, the more we're speaking to the 90% who are not in a unionized workplace. I, I wanna um, <clears throat> just highlight how important I think the, the Amazon organizing is, I mean, I think this is the, this is the fight of the century, I, in, in, my, in my opinion. And as big and scary as Amazon is, um, with, with all of its money and, and technology and other things, uh, it, I, in my opinion, if you look at traditional transportation worker strategies for organizing that, that the Teamsters really um, invented and, and perfected, um, you couldn't build a company more susceptible to those <laughs> strategies in many ways than Amazon, right? It is interconnected, it's time, time sensitive, right? Based on, on speed and it's customer facing, right? Um, in transportation where workers have been weaker is, you know, they're in the back of a Walmart distribution center and, you know, truckloads are going from producers to those distribution centers and, and there's very little leverage there. Amazon has built a very leverageable, um, network and and I think that is incredibly promising and we all need to get behind that effort because I, I do think the potential you know spillover effects of that victory when it comes it's going to be a tough slog um, are, are, are huge and just to get to that redundancy question this whole logistics revolution right is about the inefficiencies of these long complex supply chains redundancy is expensive Right? And so the more we can leverage the, the, the power that workers have as this lean network that Amazon is trying to develop right, um, to, to you know, force them to be redundant, the more the costs are gonna pile on of those strategies. That's where the power is, is in forcing them to be redundant. Well, we've covered a lot of ground today. Super, super insightful and instructive. My, uh, if I'm gonna take one line away, it's uh, we can't be afraid to lose. Um, and thank you all for this incredible panel. President O'Brien, Chris Malinsky, Jane McAlevey, Steve Vaselli. Uh, what a way to open up the year. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.